Thanks, Marvin. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Great to be looking at people face to face in a, in a meeting like this, which we haven't had many of in the last couple of years. And great to come back to UCSF. I'm looking at uh, many old familiar faces and some new ones. And um, congratulations to the graduating residents and fellows for what you've achieved. And good luck to all of you in your future career. I am uh, kind of winding down my practice, but I want to share some thoughts about um, the clinical work I've done over the years and then tomorrow talk about uh, development and innovation in orthopedics. Today's talk is on instability after knee replacement causes and treatment, and this is, um, I think, a pretty common problem sometimes. It's a common occurrence, and if you think about what we do in a knee replacement, as we expose the knee, one of the first things we do is get rid of the ACL. And depending on the uh, level of activity a patient has, the symptoms of having less stability in the knee, even though it's replaced, may cause problems or may not, and it's a common cause of revision under some circumstances. Um, I think historically when we did knee replacements, they were many years limited to elderly patients who weren't that active. They would just kind of walk out to the mailbox and back. And so not having all the ligaments or all that much stability wasn't a clinical issue. But now we've got younger patients who have knee replacements and they want two things. They want durability so that this lasts a long time. They don't have to go through a revision surgery, but they also want functionality. And if they're young patients and they're active, uh, out in Tahoe, we have kind of a two-tier group of patients, I would say. We've got the sort of older, self-destructive uh, types, but a lot of younger, healthier, active patients that ski and mountain bike. And after knee replacement, they want to just kind of keep doing the same thing. Uh, wait a minute. These are my uh, disclosures. I've done development work with uh, Smith and Nephew mostly, and uh, also Stryker have some patents and uh, consulting work, which uh, if it comes up, I'll kind of mention it as I go. The types of instability after knee replacement that are uh, talked about at least are flexion instability when the knee is loose in flexion but stable in extension. Okay, makes sense. Global instability where it's loose in both flexion and extension, and mid-flexion instability, which is probably in the mid-flexion range, 30 to 60 degrees. And this is where most of our activity is. You know, when you're sitting, your knee's at 90 degrees. When you're standing, it's actually not zero, but basically everything we do is in that mid-flexion range. What we've been taught is that during knee replacement, we need gaps between the femur and the tibia that are equal and we're gonna fill them up with the prosthesis. And here you can see the lateral view of the knee showing the collateral ligaments, which are uh, uh, theoretically uh, isometric at zero and 90 degrees. And the way this has been done since early knee replacements is with spacer blocks. So after the bone cuts are made, a spacer block gets put in the knee in extension and in flexion. And if those are balanced, you know, that's as good as it gets. Whatever happens in between, we just kind of assume is going to be okay. The ways this has been done is with a measured resection or a gap balancing technique. So measured resection means you remove the amount of bone that you're going to replace with metal. And uh, intuitively, that would seem to make sense. In the femur, there's really two cuts, the distal femoral cut and the, tibial, and the posterior femoral cut and on the tibia is just one cut. So the way we measure the thickness of the bone is with a stylus or something that gives you a certain number of millimeters from the end of the bone, but it's a mechanical measurement. With computer navigation where the bone is painted and the thing touches the bone, 
it's essentially doing the same thing. It's going to do a measured resection from the end of the bone. The uh, alternate way of doing the um, gaps is with the tension of the ligament. So this is a gap balancing technique where the distal femur is cut, the tibia is cut, and then in flexion the bones are spread apart so that the posterior cut on the femur will be parallel with the tibia and that way you get a rectangular space based on the ligament tension not based on the amount of bone you remove because the ligaments might stretch or not stretch depending on how tight this is and they're a little bit different in everyone. Despite that Flexion instability or instability has been recognized as a clinical entity commonly resulting in revision, and there can be a, a number of reasons for this. This one from uh, Stanford some time ago, publication showing that out of 83 revisions, flexion extension mismatch, which I alluded to, but other things, component malpositions or isolated ligament insufficiency, as well as loosening and wear. So loosening and wear are different because that causes more bone loss. So you have a bigger gap as a result as opposed to a direct effect on the ligaments. Intraoperative instability can occur if you can't get balance those gaps. In 0 and 90 degrees there's some mismatch or medial lateral, meaning it was a varus or valgus deformity in the coronal plane and one ligament was tighter than the other or I hate to say it, but once in a while a mishap occurs during surgery and you get an iatrogenic instability. Postoperatively, instability can also occur. So even though everything was done correctly at surgery, and the way you know this is because if one of your patients comes in and they're unstable after surgery, you're the surgeon, right? So you know it was done properly and they can still be unstable. So something happened post-op, and that can be the, the ligaments just kind of stretched out. There are clearly some patients who have a genetic predisposition to just kind of stretch out, just like there are some that have a genetic predisposition to get stiff. Um, <clears throat> and this has never really been figured out, but there probably is, uh, you know, Ehlers-Danlos, things like that we know about, but there's some subtle variants that likely occur certain patients and we just don't know about it till after they have surgery. The other ones, trauma, uh, wear, loosening, are a little more obvious. Flexion instability is essentially this. If you look at the gap in extension, it's smaller than the gap in flexion. And uh, that's where the idea of flexion instability came from. This was first reported uh, from the Mayo Clinic some time ago, 1998, these were cruciate retaining knee replacements, so they have a PCL and two collateral ligaments. <clears throat> the symptoms were not so much instability as pain and swelling at the end of the day. So as the joint gets used, it gets more swollen, gets more painful, it's not too bad in the beginning of the day, but it's activity related. And when they were revised to PS knee, there was improvement. This is the kind of thing you see in flexion. So if you think about it, what we've done with the knee replacement is remove the ACL, so we've got a PCL, and you've got the collateral ligaments, which are kind of on the side of the knee. So how are they going to control the AP movement? They control the sideways motion, and they really aren't very good at controlling the AP motion. So in flexion, the femur here is subluxed anteriorly. This is what we call paradoxical motion, where <clears throat> it uh, subluxes anteriorly in extension and posteriorly in flexion. It can occur in PS knees as well. So this is a posterior stabilized knee, still doesn't have an ACL, and the same group from the Mayo Clinic record, re, reported basically the similar kind of occurrence in posterior stabilized knees. Well, the conventional wisdom when we have a gap that's bigger in extension than flexion is to remove a little more bone from the distal femur, and then that gives you equal gaps. So this is kind of what happens when you have a flexion contracture. We start with a uh, measured resection on the femur, make our distal cut, and uh, then go to the tibia, measure the resection with a stylus, make your tibial cut, and then put in the spacer block and then kind of look at the knee from the side. And well, it doesn't extend all the way. We can fix that. 
So we go back and remove a little bit more femur, and it extends all the way. So that's been the way to deal with this. With revision components that are offset, means they can be moved posteriorly, we can also do this a slightly different way. You can add on augment here and use this kind of offset stem which moves it posteriorly, and those would be alternative ways to fill up this uh, flexion space. If there's global instability, it's loose all over the place. It's got a big gap in extension and in flexion. The collateral ligaments are intact, but they're kind of uh, attenuated. And so one solution to this is to just plop in a big polyethylene insert. And when revision knees first started, this is kind of how we did it. We just put the femur on the end of the bone, even if there was some bone loss, and then a big poly insert. The problem with this is you've raised the joint line and so it results in this uh, patella baja, which you can see here, the position of the patella should be above the joint line. This is one of those patients who had a poly insert for instability, and if you look at the orange line, you can see the patella on a lateral view is a little bit above the joint line. The joint line is determined by the bottom of the femoral component. So that's okay, but this guy got recurrent instability, the ligaments stretched out some more, had a thicker insert, and now with the thicker insert, you wind up with some patella baja. So there's always this trade-off between how thick to go and when the flexion extension gaps are balanced, and as you start raising the joint line more and more, you're essentially lengthening the leg with doing this because you're adding in more material than the leg started with, the ligaments are longer. And some of these patients do complain of a leg length inequality. Uh, this one still didn't work out and then was revised to a hinge. So with a hinge, there's really no concern about the flexion extension mismatch. The joint line can be moved distally and the patella gets back to its normal position, which is kind of important for patellar and extensor mechanism function. Alternatively, the femur can be augmented distally and posteriorly. So here, if we put on a distal augment, we use this offset and a posterior augment, then the joint line's been moved posteriorly, it's been moved distally, and a thinner insert, and now the patella's in the right spot, and this increases the posterior offset as well. So here's what I mean. This is a uh, pre-op view on the left showing the posterior offset, which is the amount of offset relative to the femoral shaft, and that's important to maintain that flexion space and keep the ligaments tight. Utilizing a posterior offset uh, here, so the stem is kind of crooked, as a modular component, this space can be increased, and that's a better way to treat the flexion space than the thick insert, and it keeps the joint line in the right position, so we avoid patella baja, and the patella looks about right. Well, what about mid-flexion instability? Well, this is a... Uh, term that nobody really understood, understands other than it's unstable during functional activities probably isn't that much different clinically than flexion instability. There have been a lot of studies now written on this. This is one of the uh, meta-analysis. This one was published in uh, 2020 and um, after the uh, meta-analysis process basically got down to 18 articles starting with a thousand or whatever those how those things go and the conclusions were pretty non-specific there are patient related implant related and technique related factors that cause this so not much useful stuff there this was another meta-analysis more recently 2021 28 articles now AP translation of seven millimeters or more was an independent risk factor, suggesting that that um, paradoxical motion I mentioned due to loss of the ACL can be a contributing factor, but it's gonna depend on how active the patient is. The dynamic instability is controlled to some extent by muscle strength, and uh, if there's too much translation or too much activity demands, it'll cause clinical problems with mid-flexion instability. This is essentially how the knee works in a CR knee. You can see the posterior cruciate ligament, but in extension, the tibia subluxes anteriorly because there's no ACL. And in flexion, 
the femur subluxes anteriorly because the cruciates kind of twist around each other. They don't really work that well one without the other. <clears throat> and uh, depending on the conformity of the knee, it'll limit how much motion and provide stability, but we rely on the articular surfaces. So here's a typical video of somebody walking with a CR knee. Really has no symptoms, the knee feels like it's working fine, but in extension you can see the tibia is subluxing anteriorly. There's no ACL, it's not a lot of conformity to the prosthesis. And in a PS knee, the cam post mechanism limits the posterior movement. So in flexion that engages, it's a substitute for the posterior cruciate ligament. On the right you can see it engage at 60 or 70 degrees and it causes the femur to roll back but in extension it doesn't supplement for the anterior cruciate ligament and essentially you get the same thing. Um, this shows the effect of joint line elevation on the mid flexion space as well. So that process I mentioned before of recutting the distal femur to get the extra two millimeters of uh, space in the extension gap and balance the gaps actually results in some mid-flexion instability, and a second recut did it more. Another study of the same thing, a clinical study, evaluated the effect of um, joint line elevation on mid-flexion instability at 30 degrees, showing the gap was increased when the joint line was elevated. So maybe that's not such a bright idea to get you mid-flexion stability, even though it balances the gaps at zero and 90 degrees. And the solutions that have been offered to kind of deal with this inherent problem, which we're sort of stuck with in knee replacements, no matter what you do right, is to provide more implants and better ways of putting them in. And one of them is to provide more sizes. So the sizes in the left and rights and the one millimeter increments are helpful to really optimize these two gaps. The other way is to provide different inserts that have different conformities. In other words, the uh, ball socket kind of stability provided by the articulation between the femur and the tibia can substitute for some of the ligament instability. Whereas historically, um, the knees were relatively uh, unconforming to allow good motion of the knee and then went to more conforming to avoid polyethylene wear. The polyethylene wear isn't as much of an issue, but the insert options and sizes help. There are ACL retaining knees. These probably have a very limited role, and historically they didn't work out so well, mostly because of problems of loosening on the tibial side where the ACL component or the tibial component doesn't really have a big keel to provide long-term cement fixation, but in uh, some indications, these can be very helpful. And just like a uni, they retain all ligaments, and so the stability and the kinematics are pretty normal. Uh, the other <clears throat> approach to try to optimize the mid-flexion space is kinematic alignment, where the cuts are made more anatomically. In other words, rather than having mechanically oriented bone cuts perpendicular to the mechanical axis, the joint line which is anatomically in varus, is um, reproduced with kinematic alignment, making varus cuts on both the femur and a valgus cut, I mean a valgus cut on the femur and a varus cut on the tibia. There are some issues with that because if uh, varus uh, alignment of the tibia is achieved, it can result in loosening, so long-term durability is a concern, but the meta-analysis of me mechanical compared to kinematic alignment showed that there are better clinical outcomes and uh, knee flexion with kinematic alignment than mechanical alignment, suggesting that this varus joint line could be helpful. Um, it is possible to make mechanical bone cuts perpendicular to the mechanical axis and wind up with an anatomic joint line if the poly is thicker on one side than the other. And this is another approach to achieve the same thing, but suggests that the more anatomic the joint line is oriented, the mid-flexion base is likely more stable um, and could provide better functional outcomes. This is a clinical study of that knee having a virus alignment showing in vivo mid-flexion instability was less noticeable than with a uh, mechanically aligned knee where the joint line is parallel to the floor. 
Navigation and I think the new technologies provide an opportunity to combine some of the, the two elements of balancing both through measured resection and ligament tension. And with the uh, navigation in place, uh, the uh, knee can be put through a range of motion and theoretically you get this graph on the bottom which shows the space medially and laterally, the gap between the two bones throughout the arc of motion, not just at zero and 90 degrees. But um, these kind of things are in evolution, I would say, an opportunity probably for better technology. Uh, this is essentially still based on a measured bone resection throughout the arc of motion, so it may or may not produce the desired information we need about how, what the mid-flexion space is doing and really how to optimize it. If mid-flexion instability or flexion instability does occur, it can be treated to some extent non-operatively. The treating is, treatment is bracing and it's a functional uh, ACL type brace, so it's a big brace, which may, many patients may use during <clears throat> higher demand activities, skiing, mountain biking, things like that, combined with muscle strengthening and activity restrictions. So usually that's not all too satisfying, I would say, for patients, but occasionally it'll uh, avoid surgery. The surgical options are tibial insert exchange, femoral revision to a posterior stabilized component, maybe with a constrained insert or use of uh, more constraint, either a constrained varus valgus or hinge device. This is a study of uh, isolated tibial insert exchanges showing the results you know, were not that great, basically. 270 isolated tibial insert exchanges for instability or other causes, and survivorship at 10 years was 68%, uh, so nothing to uh, really brag about there. But the reasons for failure were correlated with the reasons for doing the revision in the first place. In other words, if uh, isolated tibial insert exchange was done for instability, it often resulted in recurrence of the instability. This is a uh, review from uh, the uh, Journal of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons not too long ago, showing what to do for instability in an uh, algorithm uh, to uh, guide the revision. And I think it's a little complex, but basically you remove the revision, the prior components, at least the femur, and then kind of uh, check the tibia. And I think this is useful. It checks tibial slope. The more sloped it is, the more lax it is in flexion. And if the slope is okay, then basically it's a femoral revision. If the slope is bad, then you revise everything. So I think that's the one useful thing out of this. And here's an example where a knee presented, it's a cruciate retaining knee that was unstable, but the tibial slope here looks fine. It's certainly not excessive, maybe even neutral. And so that type of thing can be revised, retaining the tibial component and increasing the femoral offset with this posteriorly offset stem and some posterior augments that fills up more of the flexion space, usually with the constrained insert. So the constrained insert means it's kind of a tongue and groove. The posterior stabilized component fits tightly into the box and limits varus valgus and rotation. The other uh, thing I would mention is if a patient like this comes along and their knee was revised for instability on the other side, that's useful to know when you're planning to do a primary knee on the opposite knee rather than just treat it in isolation. <clears throat> if somebody has knee replacement on the other side, I'll spend a fair amount of time asking them, you know, how did that work out? Do you like it? And if it clunks around a little bit, then Maybe you want to do something to make sure the other side is more stable, put it in tighter, or in some circumstances, consider going directly to a semi-constrained knee. And after somebody like this has a revision, if they're not too demanding, I would go directly to a semi-constrained knee, like uh, for a valgus deformity. So even though the ligaments are intact, this has a constrained mechanism within it. You say, okay, that's a horrible thing to do. You should never use a constrained knee as a primary. But if you use a constrained implant in a primary and the ligaments are intact, the constrained mechanism doesn't do that much. If there's no ligament and it's clunking around all over the place, 
Mechanically, you're asking it to do a lot. Then the knee might loosen because the stress is on the bone interface, cement interface, or on the polyethylene or something, but these things do fine. This was a uh, study we published from here some time ago showing the results of revision <coughs> for various causes. Uh, instabilities over here, and so these bars represent the pre-op uh, before the revision, knee society score, the post-op scores in blue, and uh, a group of primary patients who are age and gender matched having knee replacement are up here. So none of the results really approach the functional outcomes of a primary knee, but the instability ones did quite well. They went from here to here. So the clinical results of revision for instability are generally pretty good other than with tibial insert exchange. This was another report showing the uh, outcomes of 37 revision knees with a con uh, constrained conler in 29 and uh, non-constrained in eight, and they were all doing quite well. The survivorship of these constrained conler processes in patients who are not excessively active is also pretty good, better than I would have thought, 95% <clears throat> survivorship for loosening and 92% for re-revision at pretty long-term follow-up. There are two mechanisms that a knee replacement can be constrained, what we call fully constrained. The first is sort of a tongue and groove where the, the post of the poly fits into a narrow box or uh, is wide enough that it fits into the box of the PS part of the femoral component. And the other is a hinge, like a door hinge. It has an axle, so that's by far the most constrained. And the um, uh, hinge allows essentially no varus valgus movement, so ideal for when there is no medial collateral or lateral collateral ligament. And MCL can kind of disappear sometimes uh, during surgery. It could be uh, associated with the valgus deformity when it gets uh, stretched out, it could be from trauma. And uh, once in a while, these just kind of aren't there at the end of the case uh, for whatever reason. So, you know, if it does happen, this is the situation that shows up. You can see obvious disruption of the MCL. And yes, it needs constraint. There's no other way to solve this. But if it's attempted to be treated with the constrained condylar post, this is the tongue and groove mechanism where the poly fits into the box you know, the poly isn't all that strong compared to the body weight and no MCL and all that kind of stuff. So the constrained post can fail if there's no collateral ligament. And it can fail a number of ways. It can pull out of the locking mechanism, it can bend, it can break. And the hinge, on the other hand, provides rigid stability um, and is the ideal solution for a uh, absent collateral ligament. Uh, why don't we use hinges in everybody? You know, patients will ask this once in a while. Well, you know, all kinds of bad things happen with the hinge, and historically, because it puts so much stress on the bone cement interface, these things loosen, and so we try to avoid them. In elderly patients, though, the results are pretty good. Here's, well, just a minimum five-year follow-up, but essentially no loosening. The uh, satisfaction is usually pretty high with the hinge because the stability is the best it can be. But all kinds of bad things can happen, periprosthetic fracture, loosening, and um, uh, mechanical breakage of the hinge, as well as patellar problems. And there's no turning back when this occurs. So here's um, one that had a periprosthetic fracture, and uh, <clears throat> not the only one that this has happened to. This is a report of, uh, well, it's a, a meta-analysis, 10 studies that met the inclusion criteria of hinges, 51 to 92% survivorship. That's a pretty big spread, but many of them obviously don't work, and complications with infection and aseptic loosening are the most common. When a hinge goes bad, all you can do is put in a bigger hinge, and if you put in a bigger hinge, there's more metal and less bone, and if there's more metal and less bone, there's less blood vessels to, you know, bring in important things to the knee, including antibiotics. And uh, 
these things can get infected. This was also a study, I hate to say, that uh, we, we reported from my practice when I was at UCSF, showing the survivorship of diaphyseal replacement compared to distal replacement. So distal femoral replacement would be like the supracondylar part and the diaphyseal is going halfway up the femur. I mean, this is getting into tumor surgery now and this is what those guys do when they whack off half the bone and put in the prosthesis. But if you do it in a 19 year old with good vascularity, I mean, I think you can get away with it. This, some of these patients, this is their 12th operation and there's not much covering the thing. So the lower curve represents the survivorship getting down to a uh, pretty low number, mostly failures due to infection. And um, so we started following the cue uh, um, uh, of the tumor people who just inherently began using long-term antibiotics in those patients with big prostheses to keep them sterile for a long time until the soft tissue envelopes vascularized, and I think that makes uh, pretty good sense. So in summary, flexion instability can occur from soft tissue imbalance um, during surgery or post-op from attenuation of the ligaments, even if everything is done correctly. The etiology of mid-flexion instability isn't well understood, but I think it's an inherent kind of side effect of knee replacement if patients are active enough even if everything is done correctly in that we don't have an ACL, we don't have menisci, we haven't really done any everything. Uh, we've removed a lot of normal structures and what we've got is the collateral ligaments, maybe the posterior uh, cruciate ligaments and the conformity of the prosthesis. So a number of things have been changed and also the orientation of the joint line. The solutions to that as I see it are better uh, implants with more sizes, more conformity options, and it's still sort of a feel. We use a combination of measured resection and ligament tension and ultimately have to constantly through the surgery sort of assess how the ligaments are doing by feeling the knee. And I think that not everybody should be put in the same tightness. A young male patient who's very active, their ligaments are like ropes they don't really have any elasticity, and they're the more demanding ones, so putting it in tight as a drum in them is fine. If you put it in a kind of elderly female patient the same way, they're gonna get stiff because you've stretched the ligaments beyond their normal length, and uh, their demands may not be as high. So there's a huge amount of uh, subjective kind of um, uh, uh, judgment that occurs interoperatively on how tight to put these in and how much constraint. And I think the uh, evolution of um, where we go from here in terms of technique is not so much more implants and sizes, but better technology to really assess this mid-flexion space. And that's where I see the opportunity for navigation, robotics, tensioners, and there's a lot of uh, development going on that way, we'll ho which hopefully will give us tools to more accurately optimize that mid-flexion space or at least define it. Revision for instability usually is associated with pretty good results because patients are unhappy when they're unstable. You provide stability and they feel better right away but it means using additional constraint, balancing the gaps usually with the femoral revision to move the joint line posteriorly with the posterior offset and a constrained component. If there is disruption of a collateral ligament, you have to just accept it. There's nothing you can do to repair the ligament. You can only replace it, at least in joint replacement. Uh, the collateral ligaments just won't heal after there's a knee replacement, so we need to go to a constrained option. And for a collateral ligament absent, uh, collateral ligament, that's a hinge. The nice thing is that the hinges which were developed many years ago have gotten a lot better. So the original hinges, they broke, they loosened, they got infected, they had miserable results, and that's where we came up with this, you know, kind of dogma of never put in a hinge. But the hinges we have now are pretty highly designed. I mean, they're not gonna last forever, but they're gonna last a long time, and they do pretty well. And if you don't wanna loosen them from the bone, we can put in a cone that has some ingrowth and get really, really good long-term fixation. And then if that does fail and it needs to go to this tumor prosthesis, 
I'm a firm believer in the uh, long-term antibiotic suppression, or at least offering it to patients, even though the data is kind of all over the place, but mostly supportive of that recommendation. So I'm going to stop there. I want to thank you once again for the opportunity. This is a, a big deal to give this uh, Inman lectureship and to be here, and I'm honored to uh, be one of your visiting professors and happy to take questions.